Good evening. This is the select board meeting for January 17th, 2023. Uh, any news up, updates or announcements from select board members? Bernard? I have two. I can't raise my hand because I'm in my car. Okay, Bernard, I'll call on you, Miriam, uh, but Bernard um, is gonna go first. Okay, I just wanted to say that our Martin Luther King uh, Jr. celebration event last uh, night uh, was very, very good. I mean, it was an excellent uh, presentation by Ed Larson, uh, excellent performances by uh, Reggie Gibson, as everyone assumed, uh, but also by Jennifer Barber and the choir, the Joyful Voices of Inspiration. I guess the, the, the main uh, thing I'd like to say is that um, beginning, I think, tomorrow, um, BIG will have a, a, a video recording of the event on their YouTube channel. Um, I will check on that, but I'm pretty sure that it's going to be up tomorrow. So for those of you who weren't able to appear in person, um, that's available uh, for you. And it was great to have an in-person event. <laughs> Great. So, I heard great things, Bernard. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Miriam? Thank you. Um, I have two uh, announcements. The first, I would uh, like to let everybody know that the American Rescue, Rescue Plan Act uh, Review Committee is convening um, for our second round of ARPA funding disbursements. Uh, I encourage you to please go to our website. We are taking grant applications from now until February 7th. Um, we will be closed at the end of day, February 7th. If you haven't gotten your grant application in, you that opportunity will have passed. Um, so please go take a look now. We have revamped the application. Um, so please look at it and be very, um, careful to specifically address the questions that we've asked. Mm -hmm. And I just want to give everyone the heads up that we have much smaller amount, a much smaller amount of money to give out in the second round, a much smaller amount of money to give out in the second round. So um, please keep that in mind. Um, and the second um, announcement and, and if you have questions, please email the ARPA Review Committee email, which is available on the website. Um, and the second announcement is that the B Brookline Commission on Disability is holding an effective communication focus group on um, January 23rd. Uh, and if you are, uh, if you fall into the category of needing aid with communication, um, we encourage you to please join us for that focus group. You can email Sarah Kaplan at S. K A P L A N at brooklinemass.gov uh, to get more information and to register. Thank you and happy birthday to my daughter who turns 14 today. Happy birthday to her from the select board. Yes, yeah, wonderful age. <laughs> John? Thanks very much, Heather. Um, congratulations, Bernard, on a really good program yesterday. Um, what I wanted to spread the word about uh, is a petition. And quick um, background on this. I think perhaps everyone in Brookline is aware of the literally decades long effort that we put into um, replacing the Olmsted footbridge over the D line um, in the um, area of the Longwood uh, T stop. And um, we did that for a number of reasons, but mainly because in Brookline, we really celebrate the, the Emerald Necklace, we celebrate Olmstead, we celebrate Muddy River Park. And on that note, there is a petition circulating, uh, which I signed myself today, and I do uh, recommend to others that they seriously consider signing it. Uh, you can find it at, excuse me, change.org. If you go to change.org and then just uh, search for Emerald Necklace, you'll find the petition. And quickly summing up what this is all about, there is a meeting coming up in Boston, excuse me, on January 19th, where decisions are going to be made about a proposed development that would 
seriously cast shadows um, on Muddy River Park, on the Emerald Necklace. And um, there are laws governing these questions in terms of protecting parkland. Um, and I think even if there weren't laws, um, the, the authorities in Boston would take very seriously the heritage that we all enjoy in the Emerald Necklace and not cast it under shadows um, during considerable parts of the day and considerable uh, parts of the year. Um, and that's the focus of this petition. So once again, it's change.org and just search for the Emerald Necklace petition. Thank you. Any other news or updates? I have one. There is going to be a celebration at the Brookline High School for the Lunar New Year at, uh, at, oh, I'm sorry, at the Coolidge Corner Library, Sunday, January 22nd at 2 p.m. If there are no other announcements, John, why don't you take us into public comment? Be happy to do that. Um, so to those who are here for public comment, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to hear your perspective on the issues in Brooklyn that matter to you. A few rules um, governing this. Each person speaking tonight is limited to three minutes. You don't need to use the entire time, but you may if you like. Please refrain from personal attacks and from addressing personnel issues. Members of the public sometimes raise questions. We're happy to get an answer um, to them, but would more likely get it to you by email from staff. Um, when you speak, you will have, um, we will let you know when you have 30 seconds and we wish that you uh, your remarks at that time. Um, and if you have anything more to say after you've spoken, you're welcome to send an email to board members expressing your thoughts. Devin, who is first on the list? The first person signed up for public comment is Sean Lynn Jones. You've been promoted to a panelist. Your three minutes will begin when you're ready. Thank you very much. I'm Sean Lynn Jones. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 1. I live at 53 Monmouth Street, and I'm also a vice president of the Brookline Green Space Alliance. Now, I happen to plan to talk about exactly the same issue that Mr. Van Scorik just raised. We did not coordinate this in advance in any way, but um, it's a, uh, I don't know whether you want to say great minds think alike or something, but we are literally on the same page with this petition and this issue. Let me give you a little bit more uh, background because there's more than just a petition here. I think the town of Brookline needs to consider how it will react to the development proposal that's going, uh, probably going forward in the Longwood medical area. We're talking about a proposal that you may be familiar with called Longwood Place at 305 Brookline Avenue. The names are used sort of interchangeably by the city of Boston and the developers. It's a major mixed use development with retail space, uh, residential space, lab space, uh, commercial space, about 1.7 million square feet, uh, bounded by Brookline Ave and Pilgrim Road and uh, Short Street, which is pedestrian there, but basically the area between the former Wheelock campus and then Beth Israel Hospital and Emanuel College, more or less a triangle. Some of the buildings will be, um, well, one of them at least is proposed at 320 feet, several between 200 and 300 feet. There are five um, in all. And as uh, Mr. Van Scori pointed out, there are some severe shadows that are going to be cast here. There has been a shadow study, like all shadow studies, it's complex and the shadows vary by day. But in a nutshell, we're talking about two or three additional hours of shade over as much as five acres, especially in Riverway Park, but also in uh, Brookline and the Carlton Street area, including the Carlton Street footbridge, Monmouth Court and Longwood Towers. I'm gonna to focus more on the park, but there's a neighborhood impact here as well. And it's important to note that much of the new shadow impact will be in Brookline because there are already shadows from the BU Wheelock buildings that are cast on the Riverway side, Riverway, you know, park side in Boston. Uh, obviously making the park colder and darker is going to degrade the experience for the people who use it for walking, running, cycling, you know, pushing a stroller or just sitting on a bench and admiring the birds and the scenery. And it's impossible to put a price tag on that. But there is going to be some real financial impacts here. The shadows are going to increase the snow and ice. They're going to make it harder for some plants to survive. They'll probably degrade the masonry and the pathways and the banks of the muddy river. 
through the freeze and thaw cycles. You and there's been a seconds. great analysis, analysis of this by one of the subcommittees of the Muddy River Project Maintenance and Management Organization. It's not just about Brookline residents, it's about commuters, students, and workers who use this park space. Uh, remember, the Emerald Necklace is not just a Brookline park, it's a regional and historic resource. People commute uh, through, they get off at the Longwood T-Stop. And what I'm asking is that the town of Brookline try to step up. This project still could be modified to reduce the shadow impacts, but the city of Boston is going to receive, according to the developer, $7 million to offset the negative impact on the Muddy River uh, Park's Emerald Necklace in Boston. You've reached There's clearly a cost to having these shadow effects. Brookline is going to experience those costs in snow and ice removal and park maintenance too. And I think the select board needs to step up and begin a dialogue about the project and particularly about you know, getting an offsetting payment if it goes forward that would compensate Brookline for literally the damage that this will do to the Riverway Park sections that are here in the town of Brookline, including the Carlton Street Book Bridge. We've invested millions of dollars in that. State, local and federal governments have invested almost $100 million in improving the uh, Muddy River uh, and restoring it, reducing flooding and beautifying it. So let's Please. protect that investment and uh, you know, make sure that this project doesn't do too much damage and at least we can mit mitigate some of it. Thank you very much for your attention and be happy to send more information or answer any questions. The next person signed up for public comment is Michael Alperin. You've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video if you're comfortable and your three minutes will begin. Thanks, Devin. Uh, and good evening, select board members. Um, I'm Michael Alperin, executive director of the Brookline Housing Authority. Uh, I wanted to come before you tonight just to thank the town and various departments and highlight the great work of many town employees. Um, as I believe this entire board knows, but uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, the Brookline Housing Authority at its 50 Pleasant Street building suffered a really significant flood and some electrical damage at its 50 Pleasant Street building on New Year's Eve. Um, it was certainly not the way I or any of our staff intended to spend New Year's Eve, and it was certainly not the way many of the town staff intended to spend New Year's Eve. Um, I, from, uh, from Cheryl Ann Snyder, have a list of everyone involved in the emergency response, and I just want to say I was blown away. I've been involved in emergency responses in Pittsburgh, Boston, New York City, uh, all in buildings even larger than this in some circumstances. This was the best treatment that I've ever seen for residents, for our staff, and it was just terrific to work with various town departments. Um, in particular, I just wanna highlight for this board that the town administrator Chaz was on calls throughout the weekend coordinating various departments, and I, it was terrific to work with you, Chaz. Um, and I wanna just note that Lieutenant Casey Hatchett came back from her vacation early to help us in the midst of the crisis. Um, Cheryl Ann Snyder was on scene probably for 100 hours that first weekend, but starting the night of the flood. Um, uh, I just want to also highlight the work of Sergeant Keith Lacey in the police department and a younger officer, Chris Rodriguez, who were just terrific with residents staying for anything needed. Uh, and then also in the fire department, Chief Sullivan, obviously, and Chief of Operations, Colin O'Connell, and Lieutenant Dave Nelson, who were all on scene Dave, uh, Dave Nelson multiple times on New Year's Eve. It was just terrific. Um, lastly, just Dan Bennett and the building department being available to make safe decisions about where to house residents. And I, I don't think I can emphasize enough, people's lives were at risk. And I was really impressed seeing the response of the town's various emergency departments, Cheryl Ann Snyder coordinating everything. Uh, it was really effective and I hope this board uh, uh, recognize it. this. I'm happy to send you the full list of the um, 19 CERT volunteers, the 13 fire department officials who were all involved, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, and the day after. I didn't want to take up too much time, but I really think there are some town employees who went above and beyond um, on a holiday weekend, really helped BHA residents, and we are really, really grateful to have such great partners to work with. So thank you. Chaz, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. Thank you so much, Michael, for that. And we really appreciated your um, cooperation and co coordination as well with your team 
um, working with BHA to make sure all those people were safe. I just wanted to briefly share, oh, uh, Deb, can I share my screen real quick? Because I wanted to share that list that Michael mentioned and put it up on the screen so that everyone watching has a sense of just how many people contributed on a holiday weekend um, uh, across um, multiple different um, departments. So on New Year's Eve, you know, look at this huge list of people who came out and then were directly involved. All these people came in coming out to be on the scene. Um, you know, each one of these people played an incredible role. Uh, it's my hope that as we continue to work through that we have the chance to thank you all individually for the work that you've done. Um, again, these CERT volunteers who came out on scene New Year's Eve, the fire department response with the four medical calls, Dave Nelson and James Clinton staying on overnight detail, really incredible work. Um, the health department with Sarah coming in as, as, as a huge leader uh, to ensure the safety and well-being of the residents. All the amazing work that the police department did, again, uh, to highlight uh, Acting Chief Jen Pastor and Lieutenant Casey Hatchett's leadership uh, in making sure that these issues were uh, appropriately addressed and resolved and that people felt supported by the police, which was a huge help there. Um, again, the, just a the large number of firefighters, the immediate response of Amanda Hurst at the libraries and all the library team opening the Coolidge Corner Library on a holiday to ensure that people who needed to go somewhere warm and dry could go there. And this massive list of CERT and MRC volunteers um, really just just excellent work going door to door, making sure that all of the people in this building were accounted for, were safe, that the people who needed to be transported away could be transported. They emptied out, you know, rotten food in fridges. They ensured that they had, you know, new food. The MRC team ensured that their medical needs were taken care of, which is particularly important in this vulnerable population. And the fire department team that handled the details, again, excellent work just across the board. It really does take an interdepartmental effort to handle disasters like this. And the town of Brookline, you know, I would say this team, this group of people led by these incredible um, department and division heads did uh, stellar work in this. We were very lucky with this disaster. Um, we had favorable weather. We had uh, favorable uh, uh, external factors like the limitation of the damage. It could have been worse, um, but it was due entirely to the response of the first responders um, that the situation was resolved as quickly and favorably as it was. So thank you to everyone on this list. Thank you, Michael, to you and your team. Um, and it just makes me really heartened to know that in disasters like this, our team is ready and able to quickly respond to the, uh, the issues at hand. Heather, may I reclaim 15 seconds of my 30 seconds just to say one more thing? Of course. Um, so just briefly, I think this board knew uh, a lot of the details that transpired during the crisis phase. I just want to let everyone know that of the nine households who had to be relocated due to water damage in their unit, eight have been relocated to other units in the building. The one other resident requires a, a handicap accessible unit and we're working on making that available in early February. And none of this affects our timing or financing or construction schedule to redevelop this building, 50 Pleasant Street. It has received um, low-income housing tax credit, credits and you will start seeing construction commence in March. Um, and we hope this doesn't happen again, but obviously it's great to know that the town is such a terrific partner uh, and has such a great emergency plan and response in place from various departments. We're, we're greatly appreciative. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you to our town administrator for keeping the select board in constant update about what was going on. At this time, there are 20 attendees. No one has used the hand raise feature or Q&A to indicate they'd like to make a comment. Which means we get to go into miscellaneous. Uh, okay, uh, let's take the meeting minutes from our January 10th meeting first. If you will recall, there was a town meeting that evening, so it was a short meeting. Any uh, edits to those minutes before I move them? Then I will move adoption of the meeting minutes. Um, some of you are on mute, so just make sure that you're not muted. And I'll call the roll. All those oh. in favor of um, 
approving the meeting minutes from our January 10th meeting. Please say aye. Bernard? Aye. John? Aye. Miriam? Aye. Mike? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, is there someone that wants to make another public comment? Devin, can you look into whether that person? Okay. Let me know if that person wanted to make public comment and we will serve back after I move the miscellaneous. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I will, uh, I'll read off the miscellaneous um, and then I will uh, move to adopt it uh, and then call the roll. I move approval of the application for 1061 Beacon Street for a change lodging house agent from Sakpreet Nahal to Yuzan Yang, question of approving the application for 1077 Beacon Street for a change of lodging house agent from Marissa Room to Sonyok Park. Approving the application for 89 Marion Street for a change of lodging house agent from Darwin Aviles to Ludwin Carranza. Approving the authorization to hire request within the engineering division of the Department of Public Works for a civil engineer accepting the following annual fire prevention prevention public education grants offered and approved by the commonwealth of massachusetts executive office of public safety to enhance our community risk reduction crr initiatives that's six thousand seven hundred eighty one dollars for student awareness of fire education otherwise known as safe and two thousand six hundred and seventy seven for senior safe Approving the contract for the fiscal year 22 emergency management performance grant from MEMA in the amount of 21,500 to be used in a variety of goals, primarily community resilience and planning. Accepting an $800 sponsorship from the Brookline Community Foundation for the annual MLK Day event to be held on January 16th, 2023, requested by the Office of Diversity Inclusion and Community Relations and Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Committee, approving the following appropriation transfer within the DPW division, $190,000 from personnel salary savings to uh, $110,000 to motor equipment, equipment repair and $80,000 to motor vehicle supplies. And finally, approving the parade permit for the BAA's 127th Boston Marathon to be held on April 17th, 2023. Any, uh, Bernard? Yes, if you don't mind, I would like to just thank uh, Brookline Community Foundation for the $800 sponsorship of the MLK event. Um, yeah, this, this was just one of uh, many uh, monetary and other contributions that met, that enabled us to pull together a really high class professional uh, program. Um, you know, we, we got a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Uh, we, we had a 35 member choir. And of course we had Reggie Gibson, uh, who is now becoming a national, uh, nationally recognized performer. But, you know, we were able to provide not a large sum of money, but sufficient funds to bring uh, those excellent uh, people uh, to the event. And uh, the Brookline Community Foundation's contribution was an important part of that, so. Great. Yes, I am sure the whole board is very appreciative of these mm -hmm. gifts that we get, um, especially from our community partners like the foundation. All those in favor of the miscellaneous, uh, please say aye, Bernard. Aye. John? Aye. Miriam? Aye. Mike? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Our regular calendar, we've got a couple of licensing issues. So who do we have on behalf of, is it Cubist Circle? Okay, 
we will skip that item and go to the uh, agenda item number six, liquor license, change of manager and change of officer. Um, who do we have representing, is it WBUR? I'm, I'm John Webster. I'm the proposed new manager for the liquor license at WBUR. Okay. Do you want to just kind of give us the lay of le the land? Do you have experience in this? How long have you been in the industry? Do you know our rules and regulations? Uh, so yes, I'm familiar with the rules and regulations. Uh, I've been operating food service establishments in higher education since 2005. Um, I've worked at Caltech and Syracuse University, namely, uh, over the period of time, uh, and I reside here in Charlestown now. Excellent. And what are the hours? I thought this was a specialty place. Um, so I believe this is uh, for for largely uh, catered catered events functions. So they would be special events. Okay. Bernard, uh, your hand was up. Was that a holdover? Uh, that was a hold over, but I do have a question or maybe just a comment. Um, you know, this is a, uh, a facility at BU, uh, campus of a lot of young kids, uh, young students. Um, and I know that uh, BU has been very responsible with respect to uh, controlling the uh, distribution of liquor at these events. I just want to ask you to um, give us assurance that, you know, you, you have dealt with situations uh, where uh, there is a possibility of students participating uh, in events like this and the you know, type of controls that you uh, would, would exercise. I know most of these events may be for adults, but um, you know, the issue is still there. So, so that is correct, largely for adults. Uh, we, uh, so I, I should be clear here, I, I am an employee of Aramark. Uh, we have our policies and procedures in place uh, as our, our bartender's card and ID. If there is anybody in attendance that is underage, if a single person is underage, we card and ID every single person. Um, so largely, you are correct. These are private parties uh, where uh, you know adults get together and have a drink or two. Um, there's security on the buildings to ensure that that is the case. Um, but yes, we have TIP certified managers. All of our caterers have gone through appropriate service training to ensure that uh, when they serve alcohol, it is in a safe manner. Okay. Uh, so do we have somebody who wants to speak or not? <laughs> I'm very confused. About no, nope. Okay. <laughs> um, this isn't a public hearing, so we can move uh, to vote the language. Any discussion before I propose that we do that? Okay, I'm going to propose that we um, approve the application of a change of manager of record from Joseph LaChance to Jonathan Webster for trustees of Boston University doing business as WBUR at 890 Commonwealth Avenue. All those in favor? Bernard? Aye. My, uh, John? Aye. Miriam? Aye. Mike? Aye. And the chair votes aye. And we also need to approve the application of a change of officer from mm -hmm. Gary W. Nixa to Martin Howard for trustees mm -hmm. of Boston University doing business as WBUR at 890 Commonwealth Avenue. All those in favor of that, please say aye. Bernard? Aye. John? Aye. Marion? Aye. Mike? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and best of luck. Thank you all. Cheers. So circling back to item number five.
Chris Coleman, if you want to unmute and give us uh, just a little overview of what you're seeking from the board tonight. You hear me, folks? Yeah. You can. Okay. My name is Chris Coleman, and I'm here on behalf of the applicant, that ZNL Restaurant Inc. It's going to do business as Cubis Circle. Uh, with me is uh, Zhang Wan Zhang. Uh, she is going to be the owner manager. Uh, so it's uh, approximately 1,000 square feet at that location. It's at 220 Washington Street. It's the, uh, the Zoo Vegan Kitchen is the in that location present. Uh, there'll be 16 seats uh, provided. Occupancy is going to be 20. The, uh, the square footage of the place is about 1,000 square feet. Uh, the proposed hours are from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, on, actually, it's 11 to 10 on Monday through Thursday. Friday and Saturday, it'll be 11 to 11. And on Sunday, it'll be 12 to 10. Um, the menu's are very varied. I was just going over with it. And uh, uh, Szechuan style is, is basically a good way to look at it. But there's uh, sushi, meat, seafood, uh, everything that you want will be there. It's kind of a, nope. so, it's not a kind of a sophisticated menu. Um, the proposed manager uh, is with me here. Uh, she has excellent restaurant experience. The co-owner and operator of the Cubist Circle in South Weymouth, 2018. She's a U.S. citizen. Uh, she'll be there 40 hours plus a week. Um, we're also looking for an entertainment license as well. Nothing more than pre-recorded music and a couple of televisions. Uh, but that's really it. And if you happen to answer any questions. That is music to my ears. Badoom ching. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, any questions for this potential applicant? I think it's pretty straightforward. I am excited to have a Szechuan option. Um, any objections for me to read the uh, vote language? Okay. So I will move approval of the application of a common VIC for mm -hmm. ZNL Restaurant Inc Incorporated doing business as Cubist Circle at 220 Washington Street. Hours of operation will be Monday through Thursday, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m., Friday to Saturday, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Sunday noon to 10 p.m. Seating will consist of 16 inside seats. All those in favor? Bernard? Aye. John? Aye. Miriam? Aye. Mike? Aye. And the chair votes aye. And finally, move approval of the application of a new entertainment license for ZNL Restaurant Incorporating, Incorporated doing business as Cubist Circle at 220 Washington Street. Entertainment will consist of radio, recorded music, and televisions Sunday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. All those in favor? Bernard? Aye. John? Aye. Miriam? Miriam and Nori say aye. Mike? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Best of luck and let us know if you need outdoor uh, dining options. We considered that from time to time. Okay, next up is an update about the Driscoll School. I see Matt Gillis and Tony Quigley. Who wants to go first? Um, I, I was, uh, I think we have um, Left Field joining us shortly on the, um, they have the presentation. So I'm hoping that we have them here somewhere because they're the folks making the presentation for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, uh, we see a Jim Rogers or Adam Keene in the waiting room. Well, while we're looking for that, and by we, I mean Devin, mm -hmm. um, why don't I move um, reappointment for Alan Christ to EDAP? This was the last agenda item, but I imagine it should be fairly uncontroversial because it's a reappointment. Um, any objections to taking this out of order? No, because I don't actually see uh, left field in the 
participant list right now. So we're gonna, I, I, hopefully Matt or somebody can ping them. Okay, I'll get a little creative. Um, why don't we do this since it didn't have a time associated with it. Um, I will move a uh, reappointment for Alan Chris to EDAB for a term expiring in 2026. All those in favor, Ber oh, Bernard, did you wanna say something? Uh, yes, I, I'm uh, gonna vote uh, to reappoint him. Uh, I just would like to make a comment that uh, in his application, he talked about accepting the um, MBTA uh, uh, communities uh, uh, guidelines uh, uncritically. And I think that, or I hope that he would you know, look at those uh, a little more critically and see whether uh, they create problems for Brookline in terms of you know our goals and the type of community particularly along the Harvard corridor that, that uh, you know we have so you know I'm not uh, you know questioning his application or anything I just want to make that make clear that I think that that needs to be looked at a little more carefully than it appears to be from his application okay all those in favor of reappointing uh, Alan Chris to EDAB Bernard Aye. John? Aye. Miriam? Aye. Mike? Aye. And I do want to mention that um, uh, Maria Morelli made a very interesting presentation on the Harvard Street card if you're not that you should take a look at. It. Didn't she make that presentation before us? She's going, going to. Not yet. Oh, going to, right. Okay. Yeah. I've seen it from from the HAB. We, we, had not, we had a presentation in April of 2022. That was from Kara Bruton though, right? Was it Kara? Yeah. I'm pretty sure that was Kara. Heather, you're on. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Trying to do two things at the same time. Mm. Um, okay. Apparently we have public comment. Um, do we have left field? Yeah. I just reached out to them and I think it was because they 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 thought this was going to go a little later, but supposedly they're coming on now. I don't have the presentation mm -hmm. materials they do, otherwise I could present it. So Okay. Uh why don't we take Scott's comment and then uh if we don't have them I'll think of something else. Mm. <laughs> Hello, members of the select board. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, comment. I, I uh, hate to think I'm filling time, but uh, I'll take the time that's available. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm commenting briefly on the on behalf of the Driscoll School Project, as I expect you'll hear shortly, I hope, um, construction of the new Driscoll School, which was um, approved by town meeting and the voters in 2019, is finally nearing completion. The kids are hopefully expected to start using it in the fall. Um, I look forward to the time when I don't have to appear before you on behalf of the Driscoll project, but instead on behalf of Peer School Construction and then the project after that. Um, you're scheduled to vote tonight on the use of terrazzo flooring at the new Driscoll School. Um, I, I believe this is a routine change order by the Driscoll Building Committee for an expense which is within the approved budget of the project. Um, that design decision wasn't taken lightly because it does affect the move-in date for the new project, um, but I've discussed this with the Driscoll principal, uh, Mr. Euclid, and he feels that using flooring, which will wear well and continue to look good under high traffic in the main entrance school of the, uh, main entrance areas of the school is important. Um, and, as, and as I understand it, the, uh, the change uh, will also include color features to allow wayfinding, uh, which is to say, will allow students and visitors to the school to find their way around the building more easily. Um, I believe our public schools are resources for the community. The main entrance to the new Driscoll is right next to the vibrant Washington Square community, uh, the commu commercial area. Um, and there is a huge opportunity there to integrate community events into um, you know, between the school and Washington Square. And I do hope that the flooring in the area puts Brookline in a good light and can stand up to the public use that, that I'd certainly like to see. Um, uh, and uh, as I think you've also heard the the, uh, the vinyl alternative is a plastic product. There are members of our community who feel very strongly we should be using alternatives to plastic wherever possible. Um, 
So, uh, you know, without without wasting too much of your time, uh, the flooring here was part of the original project, which was approved by the voters and the expenses are within the budget. I hope this is a, a straightforward decision. Um, I hope we don't have to put the school and the community to the inconvenience and disruption of a floor replacement in 25 um, years or so. And we all know what the floor looks like before it gets bad enough for it to be replaced as well. Um, and uh, I just want this to be a, a, a good example for, uh, for folks who come to visit the school. Thanks. Kate Popperman. Hi, uh, I would like to comment based on an experience I had while I was a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, during a hearing where the Driscoll Pop was being approved for special permits by the Board of Appeals. Hold on, I'm gonna try to get myself in focus there. <clears throat> okay. One of the things which the board considered was the design of the school and the overall look. We were told that in the presentation, there had been sunshades and the picture we saw of the building were sunshades, which would have reduced the entry of heat by the sun into the building, but that they were removed because of cost. The cost was about $700,000. Thus, an environmentally friendly step was removed from the school. Yet here, what is being proposed is a, an, an aesthetic benefit, which I object to when previously cost reasons were given for an environmental benefit and I will be interested in finding out in the presentation if those sunshades were put back in, and if what, and if not, why is flooring being prioritized over sunshades? Thank you. Do we have left field yet? Yes, we have left field. We have Jim Rogers has joined us here. We're on, Heather. Excellent. Uh, do you need privilege to uh, share your screen? Yeah, so I'm looking for Andy. Andy's uh, been on, has Andy DeShane's been made a panelist? Mm. There he is. Yeah. So if we can give presentation skills to Andy, we'll take it from here. Thank, thanks very much, Heather. I'm sorry about the confusion, folks, but we'll, we're, we're set up now. I apologize for that. I think because we thought this was going to be on a bit later. This isn't the school committee. <laughs> uh, Andy, if you have presentation skills, great. I do. All right, so I'll, I'll take you through the first part of this. Uh, this is right from the uh, Building Commission uh, presentation that we did last week. So you'll see a lot of this, the photographs and some of the other graphics that we did are now a week old and there has been a lot of progress made, but just the same, here we go. So uh, this is a rainy day uh, drone photo taken uh, last week <clears throat> of the roof of, of Driscoll. So Washington Street is to your left-hand side. Um, so you can see the progress there. We're, we're this close to being done with the roof, uh, the major part of the roof. It's we've had off and on wet weather for the last uh, two weeks now, so we're still trying to get it finished. Looks like tomorrow may be the day, so that's looking good. So good progress up on the roof. Um, the building is really pretty dry at this point because of that, so we're making we're we're moving along. Uh, some <clears throat> just some shots of the outside of the building. <clears throat> uh, window insulation is going well. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to the schedule piece of that. The masons are also doing very well. Um, and making, I think, good progress uh, all the way around the building right now. Uh, they're on, they're on the 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 uh, old side, the the old school side of the building right now, um, and sort of getting ready to finish things this thing up in the next month or so uh, in terms of masonry. So looking good. Uh, the image on the left is the northeast view from Westbourne Terrace. So you can see the windows going that are, that are all in. The brick is all completed there. We've got uh, phenolic panels still to go, but those are in production and in good shape. So we're making progress there. And the, the other photograph is just sort of a close-up of one of the pop-outs of, of the, the large windows and the brick. 
Interior is doing very well. Uh, the painters are in there. We're hanging ceilings as of this week. A few shots of just the progress in there, but really uh, a big transformation between uh, the last couple of weeks and the next couple of weeks. Quite a bit of work being done. The uh, the drywall crew has, I think today they had 34 people in the building, so they're really um, making some great progress. And like I said, the uh, the ceiling crew started yesterday and has, has already uh, done well. And the painters are in there following behind uh, all these folks. We do have a mock-up room. So we do have one room that has been, that was painted um, and the, the full ceiling in there. There's also uh, the light fixtures are in the, in the, the so-called summer beam. So we can look at some of those details. All that's been looked at and approved. Um, so the, the mock-up room did what it needed to do. It, it created a lot of conversation, but good, good conversations and good decisions out of that that now can be spread across to the rest of the building under construction. Uh, my piece of this pro of this of this uh, presentation is always schedule. Um, up, up at the top here, I said the project schedule is stabilized. That really just means that while there's a little push and pull every week, every month, um, we're looking at the same construction uh, substantial completion end date of uh, of January fifteenth that that we've been seeing for a little while. So that's good news. Uh, I think we've got a we've got a path to get to the end of this thing. It's going to be a a, uh, it's going to be a, a road race all the way to the end, but it'll it'll. Uh, but I think everybody knows how to do that. So, um, a bunch of milestones have just happened recently. Getting interior framing done in the last part, area B of the building. <clears throat> like I said, the mock-up room has paint, ceiling, and lights. Major equipment was moved in about a month ago, and has now been um, a huge effort to get all that stuff connected and inspected and all that good stuff. So that's moving along <clears throat> very well. We've got a good relationship with uh, with inspectional services. We've had lots of inspections happening and routine uh, walkthroughs on a, on a weekly basis to make sure that we're keeping up with inspections. <clears throat> the exterior envelope, uh, the windows. A month ago, I had I had reported that you know the the window installer was moving a little slow, and we had some concerns about you know, wh which way that was trending. Uh, even with the holidays in December. Um, that story has changed this, uh, the window installer has been doing a much better job. They've they're staffed up, they're working some Saturdays. They're, um, where they need to be right now. So they're really, they've really done well in the last month, uh, to sort of get themselves back on target and, uh, and be working right behind where the Masons are. So that's looking very good. And same thing with the Masons. This is not a production project. It's a, it's a fussy sort of exterior uh, masonry job, but they're uh, doing very well. And uh, they've been getting some some high marks from everybody involved, including the architect. So um, windows looking good, masonry moving along. And like I said before, the roof uh, in area B, the last piece of that is finishing up this week. Interior, it's funny to look at this graphic from a week ago because it's really out of date now uh, with this, the, the speed that the, uh, the drywall has been happening. Um, there's been quite a bit more that's been installed um, and they've got a, just talking to the drywall foreman today, he's got a great, a really good plan, working very well with the other subcontractors to sort of march methodically through the building and get all this, uh, get all this work done. So feel very positive about the work that's been happening, both on the uh, the mechanical electrical plumbing side of things, but also the drywall uh, team has been very, very um, efficient and organized. It's been nice to see. It's not always like that. So with the, in, the, the trend on the inside has been uh, very positive. Generally, we've been running a little bit ahead of time, um, whereas on the exterior, we've been, you know, we've been, had some challenges, but we're doing well now. And that's, sort of the schedule piece of this that I galloped through. Uh, Jim, you wanna take the budget? Sure, so um, <clears throat> this is the second page of the uh, project budget. Um, you can see the total budget equals 116 point, uh, the original budget was 116.5 million. To that, we added um, a second funding of 4.9 for the geothermal and the overall funding included the feasibility studies, 121.4 million. Of that, um, we have um, there to the left, we show the status of our contingencies and we have $4.6 uh, million uh, currently remaining in the contingency shown in this report here. 
One is the construction contingency, one is the owner contingency. They're both kind of fungible to be used with one another. One's more for hard costs and one's more for soft costs. Um, but in total, there's 4.6 million. Against that, um, there are some um, pending um, costs that have not been fully negotiated. Uh, they're still kind of hanging out there um, to be negotiated. There's some uh, pending ATPs, which are some pending change orders that total 31,800. There are some estimated changes that are still making their way through the system, which total 506,000. And there's some um, furniture fixtures and equipment overage. Uh, that was a, um, a rather conservative number of 200. I think that number is now closer to zero, uh, but to be conservative, we left it at 200 for now. That's 738,000 for the pending changes. When we take that away from the 4.6 uh, remaining contingency, that leaves about 3.9. If everyone sees that at the bottom of the left page, 3.9 remaining in contingency, which is actually a very good uh, number. If I took 5% uh, of the remaining um, 50 million um, left on the contract, um, that would tell us we need 2.5 million in contingency at this point to be actually still as a conservative number. Instead of 2.5, we have 3.8 million. And this is after, by the way, um, the, the Terrazzo numbers within those change numbers that have already been committed. So um, we have 3.9 million left to contingency after accounting for Terrazzo. Um, does anyone have um, any, before we get to Terrazzo, our general update, as you as you saw from Andy, we're in very solid shape from a, a schedule perspective. We're in excellent shape from a budget perspective. Uh, are there any more uh, kind of status questions uh, with the project before we talk about uh, Terrazzo specifically? And um, I don't know who could help us, but Adam Keene's actually trying to get on um, as a panelist as well. So if someone sees Adam Keene's name, uh, that would be great to let him in. But um, any questions from uh, uh, the board on um, on project status for Driscoll? Bernard has his hand up. Hey, Bernard. Hey, Jim. Uh, yes, I'd like to sort of ask this question separate from the Terrasso uh, issue, and that is, you know, whether uh, we are installing the sunshades that were mentioned earlier, and if not, um, you know, some explanation of why not, other than cost, if there are any, and the impact on the energy efficiency of the building of uh, not having those. Um, Andy, any comment on the status of the sunshades? I'm not aware that they're in the project. No, I hadn't, <clears throat> that, that, I think that predated me, so I'm not sure about sunshades. My recollection of this, if I may, and it's it's been quite some time since that was considered back in design, uh, there was a very extensive value engineering effort. Yes. And there were many, many items that were considered and were very carefully uh, vetted and discussed uh, by uh, the building committee and others. And uh, again, I, I don't sp remember the specifics on this, but I think the cost of the sun shade, the sun screening was such that it was, uh, it didn't necessarily justify the limited amount of energy savings you might uh, achieve on it. A lot of it was uh, aesthetics, my recollection. Of that's, that's true, Tony. I don't know if Adam has anything to add, but I can also say that I think based on where we are from- I don't think you could add them now anyway. Thank you, Tony, that's exactly where I was headed. Based that, on what that was what, that's what I was gonna say at this point, it, it, I, because if, there's, I believe, again, I'm not the architect, but I believe they would be structurally integral to the <clears throat> to the exactly. fenestration system. And I don't think it could be added now. Tony, my memory is here from a co-chair of the uh, building committee, uh, which happens to be one of our select board members, Miriam. Yeah, thank you. Also, um, in terms of the sunshade, one of my understandings, of course, I could be wrong, is that <clears throat> The geothermal system that we are now installing also keeps the temperature pretty even, allowing for easy heating and cooling, therefore kind of subverting the need to have the sunshades. So it would be an extra expense without much increased efficiency because we have the geothermal. That was my understanding, um, but I'm, I could be, I'll just leave that there. Thank you, Miriam. Adam, did you have anything else to add to this topic? No, I, I I just add that I, Tony's memory of it is correct. They were unfortunately a casualty of value engineering. Um, the uh, energy impact was deemed to be minimal, and um, uh, yeah, there's there's no putting them back on the building at this point. John has his hand up. 
Hey, John. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Heather. A um, couple of things. I, I wasn't sure um, I heard clearly uh, what the occupancy date will be. Um, do you mind just sort of putting that on the record as to the date of occupancy of the building? Yeah. Right. So, go, go ahead, guys. Sorry. September uh, 15th. So right. September 15th is substantial completion, as right. I understand it, which right. is a contractual date between the town and Gilbane. Occupancy would follow thereafter. Okay. Um, it, did, but did I hear January mentioned at one point? Uh, yeah, I, that was. I think that was misspoken, John. Yeah, it's it's September 15th um, of of this year. Uh, and as Tony said, that's a substantial completion day with occupancy taking probably somewhere between then and Indigenous People Day. Indigenous People's Day. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, one other <clears throat> sort of a follow up question. Um, as I recall it, one of the major uh, uh, reductions in cost as a result of value engineering was um, a substantial reduction in the anticipated uh, cost of the uh, m moving well, uh, well, forgive me for for for, for I'm I, I'm actually speaking about the Pierce project when I should be speaking yeah. about the school. Do you have contingency that you think covers the cost of moving into the building? That's my question. Yes, there's a budget line for it, and um, there is contingency if if necessary. Yep, in both cases. Yeah, ninety five thousand nine oh six is the budget. Right. It, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because it, yeah, it's great that you've you're doing you, you know you're doing terrific with your contingency budget, staying you know ahead of target, but um, there could be you know a, a major major draw from contingency. I'm assuming still to come. Uh, yeah, but you you sound pretty satisfied that you're you're not just on target that uh, you'll be on target when you get to the end of the project. I do feel that way, John. The the one thing that could still we talk about this at the commission meeting monthly. You know, so I believe you know we have 50% more than than one would typically hold on a job at this point, which is great news. The one spot that we still could um, uh, have a large you know uh, use of contingency could be from unfore unforeseen conditions and demoing the existing building. So that's still our you know the the one thing we really want to get through before you know we 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 truly know what we are. You know, based on the tests we've done, we believe we're okay, but we could still you know, get caught with some unforeseen conditions in the, in the demo of the building. So that's really, I believe, our one large risk remaining. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions before we jump into Terrazzo? Seeing none, let's jump in. All right. Um, so our, I guess our Terrazzo presentation is, is brief. Um, but um, we were asked to uh, look at, as a change order, um, poured epoxy terrazzo uh, in lieu of vinyl composite tile. And um, uh, this drawing that you see is the patterning of it in the area that it is. It's a, it's a little over 6,000 uh, square feet of area. It's in the main... The main um, entrance on the ground floor, right, Adam? The main entrance, the main lobby, it's where food yep. service um, works. It's a very heavy traffic area. So um, on the slide, you see the costs as they break down. Gilbane, the hard cost, that's the construction cost, if you will. That includes the cost from DePauli, who is the installer. There's some other costs uh, related to protection and phasing of the work that are kind of baked into that number. Uh, there is the JLA. Those are our design costs. Those are the costs to uh, produce the um, these drawings that were bid and um, uh, get the patterning and the color correct. And then uh, the last is the left field soft cost, uh, mostly due to uh, schedule extension for a total of 516.902. Um, advantages of Terrazzo, I know that the... Um, town has terrazzo in some of its buildings is its longevity. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon that terrazzo can last as much as 75 years. You know, um, it's, uh, it's ideal for uh, high traffic areas. It's also uh, once sealed correctly. Um, it is a um, easier um, 
uh, flooring uh, to maintain. And again, especially in a cafeteria type setting, um, it was uh, deemed important. So, Andrew, do you happen to have um, your like, Windows uh, menu open? I'm getting reports of uh, something blocking half of the presentation. Uh, I, I don't see it on my screen. OK. Mike, you have your hand up. Yes, thanks, Heather. So um, I have a couple of questions about the terrazzo. And one point I want to make is that this is a poured epoxy terrazzo floor. There have been a couple of comments about vinyl being plastic. Um, I spent 25 years in the industrial plastics and chemicals industry. And my recollection is that epoxy is a plastic. Um, so it's mighty hard to get away from plastics. And I think we just ought to set that aside. Um, the, I, I, have, I have to say that what we're talking about is something that's going to cost $84 a, a square foot or on that order versus something that's going to cost, would cost about $5 a square foot. And there have been arguments made that, well, this is cost effective because it you know, uh, it, it will save money in the long run. Um, my favorite economist uh, made the comment uh, that in the long run, we're all dead. Uh, and of course, that's going to happen sooner than, than later for some of us. Uh, but um, I'm perfectly happy to look at long-term investments as long as they have a payback. But the payback, sort of the return on investment here is under 1% per, per year. So again, I would set the just as I would set the plastic thing aside, uh, I think we should set aside the, um, the uh, oh, this is a cost effective. Um, it seems to me that what we're talking about is a combination of functionality and aesthetics. Um, and I'm not really sure about functionality. I mean, a floor is a, is a floor depending on, uh, uh, you know, the noise level that you get off the floor and how, you know, slippery and how often it has to be washed and so forth. But um, uh, the aesthetics is an interesting argument. Uh, and um, I'm willing to be persuaded. I did, however, see um, a, a schematic that showed a very interesting um, a, 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 a sort of a cubist a geometric pattern on, on the floor. And I wonder if you can describe, because you're talking about um, using the, the flooring, the color in the flooring in order to lead people through the building. I wonder if you can describe to us what the pattern is actually going to be. Uh, what is the aesthetic that we're talking about here? Well, um, Mike, apologies. I am um, I or uh, Jim or Andy or I are not the architects. I, um, uh, as far as commenting on the design, I um, beyond showing it to you, there's uh, I can't really do that for you. Um, showing it to me would be perfectly fine. Okay, great. Um, Andy, can we take back uh, to the previous slide? But Mike, while we do. Um, it would be very hard to argue a payback analysis with this, right? There is Thank definitely you. something Thank you. Thank you. That, that would be a foolish argument, right? Yep. But um, it is definitely a, um, a more premium surface uh, uh, and um, it is the grand space, right? This is the grand staircases in this area. This is this atrium has got a lot of natural light to it. Someday it's, it's got a lot of wow factor. And I, I do think it is, uh, um, there is, you know, the, the premiumness of the material um, uh, means the most, in my right. humble opinion. Right. I, as I say, I'm, I'm, it was the cost argument and the plastic argument that really <laughs> set my teeth on edge because they're both wrong. You're, you're um, right the, on, Mike. You're the right aesthetic on. Argument, uh, the aesthetic argument is an interesting one, but... The pattern that I'm looking at here, it, it's not, it's nothing at all like the rather, um, uh, uh, the rather interesting pattern that I saw in the schematic, which was uh, uh, very dramatic and very dramatic, but very, very definitely not leading anybody anywhere. Um, it, Mike, I'll say that this uh, rendering isn't doing it, the, it. It's giving you an idea of what the patterning is, but the, but it's actually, um, I believe it, it's actually a red the accent piece that's coming up kind of auburn there yeah yeah and okay. it's it is a um it's a custom red um i think it is a uh, a driscoll red it is is its origin right and that's my next question 
Um, and I, I think probably the last. And uh, I appreciate the answers that you've given, and particularly the honesty around. You really can't make a cost-effective argument about this. Um, the um, uh, what I understand is that this is a special order, right? As you've said, um, and what's the cost and timing impact of that of the special order? If you had something that was um, a slightly different color, that wasn't a perfect uh, um, match, what would you know? What, what would the, the difference be in those two, in both cost and and timing? I'm not what the uh, impact cost was uh, cost was Adam for that. Uh... For the, for the for the uh, for the custom color, yeah. I really uh, I'm really I'm not sure, Mike. Okay. I'm I'm sorry, I don't have that information. I could get it for you. I I um I uh, I don't have that. I'm sorry. Right. I remember correctly, it was six thousand dollars. A six thousand dollar difference between the two. But okay. between doing it all white and doing yeah. the red and white. Oh, I'm sorry. I and I, and, I and, and Adam, if I may, and we wanted the red and white because it was school colors wanted terrazzo because it'll last about 80 years yeah. or a vct tile floor with that kind of traffic i.e the kids walking in from recess um you know from the the top there and from washington street tracking in sand salt and everything else they're gonna they're gonna chew through that floor the maintenance costs are more than double and that's sort of the difference and that's with a low estimate of four percent uh, annually for an increase. Construction cost increase consistently seemed to happen more than 4% year over year. So we took sort of a low ball estimate, not, not to, uh, you know, you're not really going to try and make a, you're not really going to try and make a cost effective argument. Out of this, right? it, 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 long term, it is cost effective. It's just not as cost effective as it would be as if we, if we had got it with the bid, the change order price is more than, more than what it would be. Okay. So, Mike, you've done a lot of asking. Right. There I'm all set. Yeah. Thank you. Select board members that have questions too. So, yeah. when we ask questions, try to make them not in the form of a speech. Uh, John. <laughs> oh, John, I think you're muted. Thank you very much. Um, I thought Mike's questions are very good questions, and I I do want to say one thing about the uh, the, uh, the 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 eighty dollars uh, per square foot, excuse me, the eighty year, excuse me, eighty years um, as a time frame that would justify the additional per square foot cost for Terrazzo. I'm sorry to have to point this out, but we've got at least one major school building that we're proposing to demolish after fifty years. So I, I think we got to. Be careful about using 80 year time horizons for justifying the cost of products in school buildings at this point. Um, I'm going to read back just a few of the comments that were made at the Building Commission meeting on this. And, and I want to first uh, thank the Building Commission for having a very frank discussion about this uh, Terrazzo cost. Um, here are the comments starting with none of us are happy with the price, but it seems there's sufficient money for it. Next comment. I'm in favor of the product. I'm not in favor of the price. Next comment. No, I agree with you. The price is outrageous. Um, it is absolutely ridiculous. Next comment. Any other project, we wouldn't have even gotten this far. Next comment. Had this discussion taken place at the appropriate time in the value engineering, it never would have been cut out in the first place. Next comment. It seems everyone recognizes that we're paying far more than we should and everybody's okay with that. So I guess that's okay. Final comment. I don't think that's okay. I think it sounds like people are recommending that we do it anyway. So there's a lot of recognition that we are for some reason having to do it excuse me, <laughs> having, having to do with process um, at a very high price point for this terrazzo. And I'm just groping for what is the answer to why we are at such a high price point. Terrazzo does not have to cost $84 a square foot. If you, if you Google search, you know, the price range for terrazzo, you, you come to an answer on average 20 to $30 per square foot, as low as $14 per square foot. So can we get a little bit more clarification as to 
why this terrazzo costs $84 per square foot um, and, and what about the price differential is, is extraordinary enough to justify that kind of a price di differential. So before the team answers that, I, I do wanna give Miriam a chance to, I guess, say whatever she wants to say about the quotes that you um, quoted from the building commission. Um, and in my experience working in the public sector, it's very rare that you, that you pay what somebody would put in their own bathroom for tile. There is a lot of upcharge because there is, we just have a lot more contractual requirements to meet. Miriam? Thank you. So uh, I, I'll, I'm gonna say two things. The first is that despite all the quotes that John just read you, the building committee voted this, uh, uh, upvoted this with a yes. So there, those quotes are selective. They were out of a larger, more robust, complex discussion in which the building committee came out in favor of. The second thing I will say, and this is to Mike, uh, you know, this this is to Mike, this is to everybody, but this was not a decision we made overnight. This was not a, oh, wow, Terrazzo, great. Let's spend more money just for the hell of it. <laughs> this was a decision we, the committee, the building committee, we all really sat with this um, because of the cost, but because there were lots of reasons to think about this decision, not just cost, not just aesthetics, not just efficiency, not just um, the fact that in, in fact, there's a lot more plastic in VCT there than there is in Terrasso. It was all of these things together. And we were very thoughtful about it because, because it was gonna push out the move date and we're not putting Terrasso in everywhere we are putting it in really high volume use places. So I just really wanted to say that we didn't make this decision, take this decision lightly. The building commission voted four to zero in favor of this de decision. So in despite of all the objections and all the comments you just heard from John, four to zero in favor. So I, I really hope that there is some trust in us as a, as a, as a purveyor of responsibility. I realize there might be some prior poor experiences, but we really took our time to make this decision. And yes, it's not ideal in terms of cost, but we weighed everything. Uh, it wasn't a single decision based on one single item. So thank you very much. So John, I was going to call on the team to answer your question. I see your hand is up. Is this a new question or... Just a clarification and very brief one, because um, the building commission is not the same as the Driscoll Building Committee. And I, I, I believe Miriam was going back and forth in terms of the committee having decided to go for Terrazzo as a um, choice in, in the construction, a late choice in the construction versus the building commission um, which is an entirely separate body. And she is correct that they did vote. And in fact, I think I acknowledge that, you know, by quoting the last quote, which is, you know, uh, essentially saying, it sounds like everybody's for this, um, uh, you know, uh, and they're just going to go with it. And somebody said, we're going to go with it, but we don't like it. So. So okay. both the commission and the committee voted unanimously in favor of this change. Right. Yes. Yeah. But they're two different bodies. That's all. Okay. Let's have let's hear from the team. Adam, do you want to talk about procurement? Yeah, if, if I if I could, right? So um, the costs are higher than we would have liked them to be. We you know we had a very con candid conversation about that, um, but it is worth saying that we did uh, bid this, right? There's limited um, people who do terrazzo flooring, and we did we did bid this. We only received two bids. Um, of which uh, the lowest bid was uh, $355,000 to Poly, which is the major portion of this, right? So the market kind of spoke as to what the costs were. These, you know, we bought it at um, not the greatest time in, um, uh, in terms of escalation and um, uh, different materials have uh, different demand uh, these days. 
right? And then the rest of it is is uh, the so soft costs, right? And and then there again, there are some costs baked in there that are due to the logistics of uh, doing it in the sequencing, um, the resequencing of some other trades, um, uh, just based on the timing of when we bought it. That's that's about the best I can do uh, in terms of the price. Uh, Matt, did you want to um, add anything? Can I add one thing? If uh, Matt's not, um, I, I, I didn't hear That's muted. Matt was muted, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, the school committee voted unanimously to uh, submit the request and the building commission voted unanimously to proceed after uh, time and uh, and some deliberations. Uh, so it, it is really just with this board um, and this does affect the, the overall schedule of the project. We, you know, if, if we're not, if for some reason this doesn't happen, then the mm. schedule, I believe moves, moves back to August. Um, and I'm not sure how smooth that would, that would go at, at this point in time. Uh, Tony? Yes, this, you know, just, just a couple of thoughts on this. Um, you know, the, the price quotes that were referenced, they're, again, they're not necessarily um, what one would pay. And, you know, when you have a general contractor involved and under, a, frankly, under a change order circumstance, but as, as, uh, as it was said earlier, this was bid. Uh, the team did, in my view, uh, a very good efforts to contain costs to the greatest extent possible. Uh, and this is going to give you, again, it's going to improve the look of the building. It's the heavily traveled area. And, uh, you know, the other thing that was alluded to was the trust issue. And I think that's actually quite important. And the reason I say that is because you know, the building commission was established a long time ago to act on matters of construction on behalf of the town. And furthermore, about 27 years ago, I recall the town went to building committees once again to help, uh, you know, delve into these issues very carefully. And, um, you know, I think it would, it, it has the potential there to erode some trust on the part of some of the people involved in this. If, if uh, we cannot rely on um, the the good and sound work of the different bodies that went into this effort, John. Oh, I think I must have just left my hand up. So forgive me. Um, so we do need to vote on the Terrazzo issue. Um, any discussion from select board? members. Thank you very much to the team for the update on the Driscoll School. We've had so much on our plate recently that it's been difficult to remember everything that's going on in town. Mike? Um, yeah, I'll just say, um, as I said, I'm um, willing to go with the aesthetic argument uh, again Anybody who wants to argue costs with me is going to be in trouble um, or, or payback with me. Uh, and I appreciate the point about uh, trust and uh, our relying on uh, the public bodies that we have uh, delegated or town meeting has delegated responsibility to. Yeah, I believe it's called Monday morning quarterbacking. <laughs> and it gets old real fast. Uh, any other discussion. So there are three uh, proposed votes. I will read them off and then call the roll. Uh, I move approval of contract amendment number 10 in the amount of $26,171 with left field LLC for added construction administration services for change to terrazzo flooring in certain sections of the school from BCT. All those in favor? Bernard? Aye. John? 
can't say I love it, but for the same reasons that the, the building commission finally had its back to the wall and said, I, I'll say I. Miriam? Aye. Mike? Aye. And the chair votes aye. I move approval of contract amendment number 22 in the amount of 12,500 with Jonathan Levy Architects for services related to flooring at the Driscoll School project. All those in favor? Bernard? Aye. John? Aye. Miriam? Aye. Mike? Aye. And the chair votes aye. And finally, I move approval of change order number 19 in the amount of $478,000 and $231 with Gilbane Building Company related to terrazzo flooring in certain sections of the school from VCT. All those in favor? Bernard? Aye. John? Aye. Miriam? Aye. Mike? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you very much for giving us this presentation. Thank, thanks for tonight, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. So moving into our second school-related presentation, what to do with former Newberry College? <laughs> Short-term use. Chaz, do you want to kind of recap what we've said what we've done what we need to decide to do tonight sure so i think you know the leading contender on this has continued to be the um the schools have, have asked for the use of the space for some of the space during the pendency of the um uh the con potential construction of uh, reconstruction of the pierce school um and since then there have been a variety of discussions both here and across town about is that the highest and best use of the space temporarily? Can't the schools go somewhere else? Um, all, all of which are, are, are legitimate questions that I think have been, you know, really kind of delved into in, in some detail, both by the school team and our team. Um, you know, the on the town side, our position on this has always been, if the schools are to use this space, which is the upper two floors, uh, we just ask that it be conditioned stringently on the building the work of the of the town departments that are currently there not being disturbed um with the school because my understanding the schools have agreed to that agreed to that throughout um you know we just need to as as always when people are sharing space if this goes through there's always that concern of you know turf and who's paying utilities and all that and we just need to be very cognizant and on top of that before those issues become uh, unmanageable uh, we need to be proactive uh on the town side and on the school side in identifying issues and raising them to resolve uh, between the superintendent and me um, before uh, they get out of hand, they get to you or the school committee. So um, that was on the town's end, right? We we would just ask uh, that the space be conditioned on the continued use of it for town purposes that's not being used for the schools. Um, and I see you know both um, David and Linus are here. Um, and I know that they have uh, provided in your packets an additional presentation that I believe was made to the school committee. And I wonder regarding potential alternatives, because I know um, we've received messages, I've received messages, and I know you have received messages, you know, suggesting alternatives uh, and figuring out. Um, oh, uh, Devin says, I, I don't think it would wind up in the packet, but maybe if the if that group wants to um, Someone, someone over wants to uh, just briefly summarize the uh, the results of that. You know, the the school analysis and what it what it said um, for the select board's benefit. I think that would help kind of put a final piece of the puzzle together for the select board team and let them make a decision one way or the other. They were mailed to us, by the way. It was mailed to you. Yes. Okay. At least I got it. <laughs> Good. I got it. Good. Maybe so. Maybe David or uh, Linus, if either either you want to uh, just briefly summarize for the broader community what the kind of findings there were. Um, I 
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for the invite again. I have uh, with us uh, the principal of the uh, Pierce School, Jamie Yadoff, is here with us. And I believe Devin Matt is still in maybe, oh, there he is, Matt's there, um, can give. So I'm going to ask Jamie to give more of a quick synopsis on the educational platform that was shared at school committee, and then ask Matt to do a quick review of the various leasing options and costs and those types of things. And then David can provide the commentary for, on behalf of the committee. Thank you, Dr. Gallery. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Um, so I'm just gonna go all the way back to the beginning, but move fairly quickly on the assumption that most of this is repetitive for most of you, but it will refresh everybody's memory. So we first um, started talking about swing space being OLS and Clark Road. In fact, the space was originally up for rent as Pierce Overflow Space, and then the intent was that it would continue to serve as swing space. Beep and people from what was the Sperber Education Center um, school side administrators ended up moving into that space, and we took over the SEC in, in lieu of moving over there and dividing the community for more than a decade. So um, that was the original plan and was in the original budget. And then we needed to get that budget number down below a target number. And the, the place that we could take the biggest chunk out without impacting permanently the programming for the school was the relocation budget. And so the relocation budget was cut to the extent that it no longer allowed us to consider leased spaces, which meant we needed to look exclusively at spaces that were owned by the town of Brookline. OLS can hold approximately two thirds of our school community. That leaves us finding a home for three grades of students. We did initially look at Driscoll as an option last summer. We included both the Driscoll and Pierce communities in a community presentation about that and solicited feedback. Um, Dave Euclid, the P Driscoll principal and I spent a lot of time talking about that. The initial proposal um, looked at potentially moving sixth, seventh and eighth graders there. Um, as school leaders, we had significant concerns about whether that schedule, um, a six section super middle school schedule could be built on that facility. And we concluded that the only feasible way to do it would be to move our K to two students there. Um, community feedback was not warm and fuzzy about that. Um, the specific concerns were as followed. I'll run through them all. There would be um, an impact on deep classrooms because we would need those early childhood classrooms for our K students. And since we're not renewing the lease at Clark Road, that would have a disproportionate impact on BEEP, who would be losing those three spaces in addition to the current lease spaces. Um, there are concerns that are significant about outdoor space access for the first two years, um, the first year that the building is open um, and into the second year as demolition continues and the grass or sod is placed. There were concerns about both Driscoll and Pierce communities having less access to extended day programming given the increased numbers of students on that site. It would also mean the potential loss of extended day for our students in grades three through five because our current extended day doesn't have the staff capacity to support two sites. There were significant concerns that rebounding Driscoll enrollment could quickly lead to overcrowding in the K-2 grades. There were community concerns that the Pierce community would be lost during those K-2 to two years and that the transition for our Pierce students to that swing space for grade three would be especially challenging as they were separated from those friendships. There were also significant community concerns about our K-2 students being separated from their grade three to eight siblings who walk them. Pierce is largely a walking district. Many of our families don't have cars. And then Driscoll community members expressed significant concern about the impact on their school culture and having that many non-Driscoll students there as they're attempting to come back together in this new building and really build their school culture. So given that, we turned our attention to other town-owned buildings, and that's where um, the Newbury option came up. That space is very well suited for our middle school students. Its physical design is such that it has lockers, it has nice wide windows, it's got appropriate sized bathrooms. We know that um, OLS can accommodate K-5 to because it has before, so we have experience with that. Also, our 6th through 8th graders are much more capable of handling busing or a longer commute than our K-2 to students would be. And so that made a lot more sense. It also preserves our extended day K to five programming, which was something that people were concerned about with the Driscoll um, option on the table. 
So, you know, we've walked the space several times. Um, as uh, Chaz has said, we have um, agreed to partner as much as necessary with the town to ensure that their work can continue uninterrupted in those spaces. We're very used to sharing space at Fear School. That's definitely something we've had a lot of experience with. And so um, we're ready, willing, and able to share that space. And I'm happy to take any specific questions when everybody else is done. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Matt, if you wanna talk about the various leasing options. Right, so we we really looked at three options. The first was uh, remaining in Clark Road. Uh, we couldn't reach a, a tentative agreement with the landlord uh, to a price that we thought would work. Um, and so even if we extended uh, the last known price that we had, that would cost us uh, around $6 million. Um, and folks didn't find that really acceptable. We did get word about uh, St. Mary's. Um, School right across the street, the old high school. I believe the last high school class graduated there in the early 80s. Um, it's been used as a couple other things. Most recently by uh, Facing History, as I believe Jamie and I found three classrooms in there and a bunch of offices. Uh, the square footage, the layout, and the egresses, it's not a it's not a conducive amount of square feet. And going through the, the high school project, which... Uh, you know, uh, third floor renovations in the quad, which we thought were going to take about four and a half months, is on pace to take about nine. Uh, there just aren't uh, always the contractors out there to do the work in the time that you need it done. And um, trying, trying to turn somebody else's building into something that works for us in short order uh, didn't seem like the best approach. And then we're back to looking at, at Newberry, uh, a property the town owns. It was once used as a school in his office space. And, um, you know, thankfully it was Pierce of all communities where they're used to an open floor classroom design. And we could use some, some of the open floor spaces to run uh, a couple of classrooms at the same time as the community is pretty used to it. So, um, you know, that that's pretty much where we're at. And that, that would be the, the shortest amount. We do have a relocation budget as we do for pretty much all the school construction projects. Um, and we think we can make it work um, in accord with, you know, the overall overall project. Um, you know, budgets are plans. People make adjustments uh, and committees make adjustments. And then we still work within the overall uh, budget of the, the project. So the, should the project go forward? And I'll, I'll leave it at that. John? Uh, You're on mute. Yeah, is this is this an appropriate time for questions? Sure. Great. A um, couple of questions. Uh, I'll start with this one. Uh, I, there was discussion at the latest school committee meeting on this. Um, near the end, uh, uh, Jamie Adolph brought up uh, the question of whether the building department which is occupying the first two floors, I guess it's building and engineering, um, would actually be okay with giving up, say, half of one of the two floors, which would then open up the possibility of there being some, some not, not gym space, but, you know, just kind of physical education space, uh, you know, weight training space, whatever, and also maybe some, some room for um, some kind of a mini cafeteria type space. Is that still the the plan here? Because I'm hearing conflicting reports as to whether there's willingness or whether it's thought to be a good idea that um, the schools should occupy more than just two floors. David? Yes, so to clarify uh, that issue, John, uh, I also said very clearly at that meeting that we do not want to be looking to displace any other functions that are currently taking place at Newbury. However, there was indeed a discussion about how we could optimize the experience for our students at Newbury. So to the extent feasible, if there are, is additional space available in the lower levels, then we would like to be able to utilize them. The school committee uh, voted unanimously uh, to recommend to the select board 
that you authorize us to use Newbury, the Newbury College Academic Building as swing space for the Pierce Construction Project. And again, where feasible to uh, explore additional space within the building that could optimize the overall school experience so that we could have dedicated space for art, lunch, and physical education. But we would want that to be a collaborative effort not to displace anyone. So we are hopeful that both are possible. Okay, um, second question, uh, has, <clears throat> given the vintage of this building, has it been checked for say asbestos or any materials that might um, require mitigation? I'd have to defer to the building department on that, but it was it, it was occupied, uh, you know, prior to us purchasing it. And it will be checked for those things before we put children in there. Bernard. Yeah, a uh, couple questions. Number one. Um, I assume we're going to have an MOU or some other document to sort of memorialize the terms of uh, the school's use of the building. We can certainly do that. Yeah, yeah, we can draw that up. That's fine. Yeah. One thing I'd like to include is a hard move out date um, based on when uh, Pierce School is open. Uh, I, I don't want, I mean, if the schools are going to use it beyond that period of time, I think they need to be in line with all the other. Uh, people in town uh, seeking to use uh, Pierce School, the um, Newberry, for everything from uh, swimming pools to uh, housing and 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 other things. So, I, th I think that that should be a, a key uh, piece of the um, of the uh, MOU. And I, I suggest we have an MOU. The the other thing is, um, you know, comparing the cost of uh, Newberry with Maimonides and St. Mary's was a little unfair because we didn't include in the cost of Newberry uh, the rental that uh, rental costs that uh, would otherwise be included in a building like this. And those costs, I mean, I know that, you know, we, we, we want to make it easy for the schools and, you know, you're going to be paying for utilities and things like that. But you also have the issue of the bonded debt that uh, was used to purchase this. Um, so I guess I just want to make the point that you know, comparisons that we've been given, you know, aren't really very fair in terms of the true cost of the various options. So I, I have a different opinion, but I'm going to um, call on Mike Stammen first. Um, thanks, Heather. Uh, uh, that's an interesting comment from uh, uh, from Bernard about the um, sort of the sunk cost uh, question that we that. I think that's a very, that's thin ice, Bernard. Um, uh, so I think one of the things that I, I want to make sure is, is heard here is that this is a town building. It was purchased for use by the town. And there is, uh, I think, uh, a, a fair amount of concern that it remain a very clearly a town building that it will revert after this one situation to being uh, available fully for the town to do whatever uh, the advisory committee um, uh, decides should be done with it, whether it's a uh, swimming pool, a hockey rink, uh, uh, 12 stories of uh, affordable housing, uh, whatever. Um, and I say that because um, I know that the school has been very protective of its own, quote, own buildings, even though those buildings are paid for by town taxpayers. Um, and uh, I, I just want to make it clear that an MOU is not just a good idea. Uh, it's an imperative. So Mike actually kind of touched on, I, I guess, what I was going to object to. Um, you know, it who do you assign the fixed cost to? Do you assign it to this temporary use? Do you assign it to the overall longer term use? You know, when we get there, there was an outpouring of support that we should buy this property and everyone knew that we didn't exactly know what we were going to do with it. Now, I think that that meant that everybody thought 
that what we were going to do with it was what the thing that they cared about was going to be. And, you know, so um, the costs are sunk. Now we got to figure out what to do with it. And it, it's been a complicated process to get there. And there seems to be a short-term use need and a longer-term use need. And in my short term on the select board, nothing ever takes as short a time as you expect. So we need some time to figure out what the longer term use is. And yeah. I trust that we would be spending money to put kids in space that we do not own and maintain. And so I do believe that this is a cost saving measure. Um, John? By the way, I wasn't doubting that. Okay. Um, okay. Um, th thanks again. Uh, I just want to get clarification on the St. Mary's question because, frankly, I, I thought St. Mary's had been ruled out because, I, you know, every time it comes up, I hear that there is a plan for um, a veterinary um, clinic to move into that building. And in fact, there is such an application um, that's kind of moving, making its way through um, the processes at Town Hall. So, is this even worth comparing? What, what, what made us think that we might actually still have a shot at leasing for you know, a considerable period of time, three years minimum, um, that space? I saw Matt raise his hand. Matt raised his hand to answer. Yeah, so Collier's, uh, you know, the same, end, the same uh, broker uh, that we bought Newberry from is also the the, the broker for the Archdiocese of Boston. I'm not sure exactly how they reached out, um, but they told us they were in the process of that, but it wasn't finalized. The Zoning Board of Appeals needs to change uh, uh, the zoning so it could be used for medical purposes. And they were considering us as a plan B as we were considering to see if this would be a viable plan B or C for us. So that, that's why we went and took a look at it. David? Just to add on to what Matt was saying, uh, anytime that we are undertaking a major project, we want to exercise our due diligence to make sure that all potentially viable possibilities have been explored and exhausted. And so that's why, even though we weren't really sure that St. Mary's would be available, we thought that given its close proximity to Pierce, we might as well check it out because sometimes other plans fall through and see if it could be a potential match. And it really wasn't. When we went and explored it, it only has three classrooms. It had been converted into office space. It would cost an inordinate amount of uh, time and money to get it ready to serve as potential swing space. Uh, and that's not even getting into what the cost of a lease would be. So it just did not work out. And that's what brought us back to Newbury which had been among the leading options all along, but we did want to look at what else we could possibly uh, do. And this was the best fit. Miriam. Thank you. So um, first, thank you uh, to, to you, David and Linus and Matt and everyone for your due diligence on this. I found the presentations quite helpful. Um, I. I to me, I, I'm with Heather in this. I think that this is, and with Mike, I think this is a great short-term use for this. I think an MOU is a good idea. Um, and um, I, I think the biggest concern that I heard from Pierce parents was the transportation issue. And you know, having the busing there is, is mm. paramount and it's in there. I see it's in the budget. I see it's in the planning. I see even things like, having a stop at old Lincoln so that older students can walk home younger siblings. So I appreciate the thoughtfulness of it. And this has my support. So we've talked about this for a couple of weeks. Um, I believe that it is time to actually vote it. Now I will echo that this is for a short term use. Bernard, uh, I'm glad that you raised the issue of an MOU. I think that's a very good idea. And instead of um, an absolute date, I think it should be tied to um, a opening date. Opening of the school. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you know, 
we, we just leave the date tied to the opening of the Pierce renovated school. And my apologies, Bernard, mm -hmm. you suggested the MOU, thank you. No problem. Uh, so I'm just, oh, so there's just one vote. Um, shall I read the vote? And then I'll stop to see if anybody has any comments before I call the vote. Okay. So I'm sorry, I, mean, I had a question. I didn't get my hand up. Mm. Oh, okay, John. Yeah. I mean, g g given um, that we have now raised this question of an MOU and it's not inconsequential, I mean, be within the MOU that we determine um, exactly how much of the Newberry space is the uh, Bristol school going to use um, and how much will be left to the town's use. Um, shouldn't we wait until we have the MOU to take a vote on approving the, the um, are we just approving this in principle? What are we doing here? I would say we're approving it in principle. I trust our town administrator to work with the superintendent to get something that reflects the many weeks of discussion that we've had about this. Okay. We'll, we'll, um, We'll we'll definitely reach out. And, you know all all of this I think is contingent on us reach, reaching that agreement in the MOU that, that tracks with the language of the vote here that we've kind of put to, that staff have put together, which I think covers all the bases on this. I do also just want to make sure that everyone is aware, right, that the knock on impacts of this right in, include you know uh, um, funding in this funding in the SIP for some of this um, uh, some of the relocation of the admin staff, right? There's a uh, a request there on the um, um uh for the um, office relocation in the sip of $115,000 so i do just want to make sure that everyone knows that uh in the capital budget um there is a request out there uh it's a six figure request so it's not a not a not a million dollar request but that is a part of this so just so everyone is aware and there's no surprises on that front mike does that change your mind no i, I i'm just wondering whether um there's a mechanism for including that in the school budget. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a job for the town school partnership. <laughs> we will we will get to the bottom of it one way or the other. I think the, the aim here is if you say if you say a yes vote on this opens the process up to get an MOU together that that hashes all those details out. Yeah, I think the reason why we should get the ball rolling on this sooner rather than later is because you know the peer school project is ongoing and they need to know sooner rather than later <clears throat> where they're going to put these kids. So I will read the language and then I will stop, pause, see if there are any hands raised before I call. I move that the public schools of Brookline be authorized to use portions of the former Newberry College site on a temporary basis during the short-term relocation of certain grades of the Pierce School while that school's main building is being demolished and rebuilt under the condition that the town's existing uses of the Newberry College site, including but not limited to uses by town departments and those covered by the existing parking agreement for the site are not disrupted. And all of this will be codified in an MOU put together by town staff. All those in favor? Bernard? Aye. John? Aye. Miriam? Aye. Mike? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you very much. Moving into, I think our, no, nope, our second to last bit of business this evening. Good evening, Ms. Murphy. Good evening, everyone. Uh, would you like me to begin, Chair Hamilton? Yes, if you just kind of, because this is the first time this has ever happened in the almost six years that I've been board. So if you just kind of want to do a lay of the land as to what we're discussing here tonight and why. 
Certainly, I'd be happy to. I do have a memory, though, of an architect who was on one of the committees, maybe the planning committee um, or or ZBA or something. Anyway, I think there may have been one Chair Hamilton, but maybe it was more than six years ago. I've lost track of time. So good evening, Josh. I'm Jocelyn Murphy, speaking to you in my capacity tonight as a trustee of the Walnut Hills Cemetery and therefore a special municipal employee. Um, as this board is aware, the state conflict of interest law governs the ethical conduct of the municipal employees, and Section 19 in particular prohibits municipal employees from participating in matters in which they have a financial interest. However, there is a provision in Section 19 that permits municipal employees to participate in such matters if their appointing authority determines that the financial interest is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the municipality can expect from the employee. At a meeting next mm -hmm. week, the cemetery trustees have been asked to consider two locations of the cemetery for purposes of burial expansion. One of these areas is located behind the Putterham Library near Bellingham Road, and the other is adjacent to Allendale Road. Both of these locations are located distantly from my property. However, because I'm a cemetery abutter, I am presumed by the Ethics Commission to have a conflict of interest. So to be clear, I'm not seeking a waiver of the presumed conflict, but instead a determination from this board that the presumed conflict is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of my services as a cemetery trustee. I believe I'm the longest serving cemetery trustee, and I've developed a very deep respect for the cemetery status as a National Historic Registered Property. And as stewards of the property, I believe that the trustees should consider expansion proposals like this holistically, in this particular case, in this particular case by reviewing the existing cemetery master plan to determine whether this proposal aligns with it by considering the town's recently published urban forest master plan to determine whether it will result in the unnecessary loss of tree canopy, and by consulting the Department of the Interior Standards for the protection of National Historic Registered Properties before proceeding. On this basis, and in view of the fact that the proposal for expansion is not near my property and therefore is not expected to affect it, I request this board's determination that my presumed conflict as an abutter is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of my services as a trustee so that I may participate as a trustee in the meeting next week and in future meetings. Um, I would add if it's helpful to you in considering this determination, um, there, there was a section 19 um, disclosure and request for approval a number of years ago from a board member, um, uh, which ultimately was approved by the select board. But more recently in Wellesley um, in 2020, Wellesley's town council sought and received a favorable section 19 determination from the Wellesley select board um, which authorized uh, town council to participate in matters concerning the development of a real estate um, project that directly abutted the townhomes where the, the town council resided and was a trustee. Um, of course, the circumstances in this case are quite different where the potential expansion proposal is distant from my property. In any event, I will be happy to answer any questions you may have concerning this request. Great. Um, oh, Bernard? Uh, I think Miriam was first. Okay, Miriam? Thanks, Bernard. Uh, thank you, uh, Jocelyn, for the presentation. I, I have a, I'm just a little, I just need a little background. If you have always lived in your current residence and have been a long-term trustee, why is this an issue now? It's an issue now because the project, uh, first of all, I should go back in time a little bit. Some of you may recall when a cell tower was proposed at the at in uh, within Walnut Hill Cemetery. Um, however, that the proposal was to install the the cell tower at the farthest reach of the cemetery um, from my property. So I called the Ethics Commission um, Council and asked um, whether I was able to participate in that, and they said because it was so far away, really there was no expectation it would affect my property, and so I was. I didn't, I don't believe I requested section 19 approval from the board at the time because of that opinion. 
in this case, um, staff, uh, Alexander Vecchio, who's staff to the cemetery trustees, um, along with the landscape architect that was hired, um, proposed a number, a number of locations, one of which, um, when I looked closely at it, was not far from my property. In fact, it was nearly behind. Um, this was at the last meeting in December. However, the trustees ultimately decided not to pursue that particular lotion, uh, location, but in the exercise of caution, I decided it would be a good idea to seek your approval under section 19, so there would no, be no question about my ability to participate as a trustee. Can, I hope can that answered your question. So, so you didn't move and what changed is you saw that this was gonna have a, you, you were concerned because this was gonna have a direct impact and then I'm just trying to figure this out. So, so there is a presumption that the ethics commission has determined that abutters to development projects there have a presumption of a conflict, um, regardless, I suppose, of where they're located as an abutter. So yes, my property, um, I, I have property that abuts um, uh, on Baker Circle, which is, um, as I said, distant from the two current proposals, but nevertheless, I am an abutter. And so I do have a presumed conflict. Thank you. Bernard? Okay, so the, uh, the the expansion is into land already owned by the cemetery, but the concern is that um, you may be affected because you're afraid of being next to a cemetery. I mean, is that is that is that really the issue? I, I guess. I mean, it's hard, and maybe maybe this is not something that's worth uh, going into. But it seems to me kind of ridiculous that uh, you know you don't have shadow problems as you would have if there was a large apartment building. Uh, you don't have, um, you know, a lot of construction work. So I guess the the uh, real conflict that is presumed is that you may be closer to a cemetery and ghost. <laughs> you know, yes, I've been in a butter of the cemetery since I moved to Baker Circle in the in the nine, late 90s. By the way, it's a beautiful cemetery. I encourage all of you to visit it. If you haven't, I consider it one of the jewels of Brookline. Um, and so I consider myself fortunate to be in a butter. Um, but I, but I, I suppose the notion is if any development is to take place, there's a presumed conflict, um, which is uh, which is what raises the necessity of my request. Yeah. John. Thank you, thank you, Jocelyn. Um, I have to say, I'm I'm really puzzled that uh, that this is considered to be by the ethics commission to be a presumed conflict. In that, um, you know, with our form of government, um, it's often considered to be a plus to have someone who's got, you know, who's from the neighborhood, or you know, um, think about the situation we went through, you know, with. Um, just just in recent weeks with uh, the Hancock Village property and all of the people who are very, very, very concerned about um, the impacts that are being caused by construction there. And think about the town meeting members who also are, are some of them, you know, very near neighbors to all of this. And they get involved and they try to lobby and they try to represent the interests of their constituents. It's a you know it's a good thing to have people who are immediately impacted, um, occasionally be involved in the decision making um, uh, on issues such as this one. So that's my puzzlement. I'll take you know as given that the, the ethics commission has ruled. Would there be the option of us simply uh, um, leaving this alone and you uh, recuse yourself? from a vote that is considered to be one that might impact your property or impact your property because it doesn't impact your property, if you know what I mean. Um, so the option, and in fact, what I did at the last meeting, there wasn't enough time. Um, um, I was somewhat surprised, as I believe the other trustees were surprised by the locations that were chosen for this expansion. 
Um, and so I didn't have enough time to seek a determination from this board. And so I reached out to the Ethics Commission Council and it, I mean, knew this answer, but I confirmed that I was able to participate as a private citizen, which is what I did at the last meeting. Um, but I do think that I add tremendous value to the, to the Board of Trustees, frankly, by virtue of the fact that I'm in a butter and I have a very good knowledge of the property, probably better than anyone else because I've served the longest and I'm in a butter. Um, which is, was the point of me saying that I believe we should be looking at this proposal holistically. Um, and so I think I'm a valuable participant and that's frankly why I'm asking for your determination that I can participate as a trustee, notwithstanding the presumed conflict. Uh, Chaz? Thanks. Um, just, just a quick question of practicality here. Um, if the board grants this so this, this is a waiver to participate in a specific matter. I guess that qu my question is, how do we, how does the board deal on an ongoing basis with this continued presumed conflict, right? The conflict doesn't go away um, on a, on an issue by issue basis. Is there, is there a mechanism that you're proposing that allows this to happen in some way where the board doesn't have to take a vote every time you're asked to consider an issue as a trustee? Um, is there is there some is there some way to work what you're what you're asking for that doesn't involve this recurring? Um, yes, in fact, I believe I've done that. I believe I worded the request in a manner that would permit me to participate in future matters. I mean, if if a decision was made to um, you know develop the cemetery up to the property line of my house, you know, I think that would that might be a circumstance where I would, you know, have a, perhaps a real conflict, right? Because there would no longer be a vegetative buffer between my property and the, and the cemetery, which by the way, is considered to be a value to folks within the cemetery as well as outside of the cemetery. So I think the language that I've drafted in my request is broad enough to cover future similar proposals that don't directly affect my property. Mike? Uh, I, uh, I have no problem whatsoever granting the waiver and I appreciate um, the, um, the care that, uh, that Jocelyn brings in asking, but I just wanna say that I agree with it. It's a beautiful property, it's a jewel and I actually don't intend to visit it. I intend to be there permanently until <laughs> <laughs> some future day. Um, <laughs> Uh, I would all urge. I would urge you actually to all take a look at, uh, and if you don't have other arrangements already. May May I add that at the height of COVID, um, people in Brookline and probably neighbors too found, discovered it, and we had a tremendous number of, um, rec, you know, walkers and you know folks riding bikes and so forth. It was really fun to see. You know they. So I hope you will visit it. It really is a beautiful place to walk. So very, very different than Mount Auburn, which is what we tend to think of as being, you know, sort of the cemetery extraordinaire. It's not not that that way at all. It's really beautiful. not quite because Mount Auburn is a private cemetery, but frankly, it was modeled after that um, okay. that type of cemetery. Yeah. So we're very proud of that. And there's some very interesting people buried there. H. H. Richardson is buried in the Walnut Hill Cemetery. So. Yeah. Miriam. Thank you. Um, so having listened to everybody, I, I, I would support a workaround of some sort. Um, it, it's unclear to me what, like, can we define what it is that you recuse yourself from votes specifically on this particular issue? Or if we can really define it, I would, I don't see why you have to come off the committee totally, but rather just on issues that would really directly impact or could potentially directly impact you. Yeah, so um, that, you know, that would be my plan. I, I, as I think I just said, at least that was my intent. Um, and so as you can imagine, there are there, there might be a proposal, for example, to uh, repair the stone wall on Allendale Road. Um, which again is the farthest reach from my property. I would hope that I can participate in that. Um, so my suggestion is that if there is a proposal that directly affects my property, 
I would come back to you and seek um, particular uh, authority to participate as a trustee, or I would simply recuse myself, depending on the circumstances, as I did in December. Bernard? Yeah, I don't know if Miriam was suggesting this, but it's, it's sort of goes without saying that if there's a development right next to your property, you would come back to the board and, and seek a, a waiver. Uh, so I don't think we need to make any changes to the uh, form that you put together. If that's what you know is being suggested. So. I mean, this this is straightforward as far as I'm concerned, and I appreciate your your action bringing it to us so we can discuss it and understand this sort of obscure level or obscure aspect of the ethics uh, law. Mary? Yeah, to be clear, I wasn't looking for a change in the forum, but the forum is not that granular. Um, so I just wanted to, I wanted to be real clear because I really came in to this discussion a blank slate. So I just wanted to, besides obviously having read the packet earlier today, mm -hmm. so I just wanted to to be really clear on what my understanding was. So you know the the determination. So so the agenda um, suggested that you would be waiving the conflict, which is not the case. It's I'm really asking a, a, from this board for a determination that the presumed conflict, that is the fact that I'm in a butter, um, does not would. It, you don't expect that it will affect, you know, my ability to serve as a trustee. Um, right. You know, yeah, that's more clear to me now, right? Based on what I had in the packet, that was not. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I apologize for sort of screwing mm -hmm. that. Up. So, from you know, we we rely very heavily on volunteers to help us make decisions uh, for this town. And if you want to get into everybody's personal business, I'm sure you could find lots of potential or the appearance of conflicts. Um, I am fairly comfortable with this, um, but you know, we, we all should be um, cognizant of the fact that the Ethics Commission, uh, I guess, defaults to a position of assuming that there is a conflict. So. Um, people may make accusations and we will just have to, you know, dust your shoulders off. So any other discussion? So do I read the language? Um, so the language, um, yes. Yeah, so the language is fairly prescriptive. Um, so what I require is, is um, a written determination, which I think can be a vote uh, made by the board that my presumed conflict of interest in these matters is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of my services as a trustee. Okay. Could you copy and paste that into the chat um, just so that I have access to the language? Sure. Yeah. That is not what's in my script. Okay. If I do this, I'm gonna have to fiddle with it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Or you could screen share. And then I just read it. Um, shall I shall I put it into a vote? Please. One last thing I have to try to do tonight. Sorry, I have to fiddle with this language a little bit.
Okay, I'm almost there. <clears throat> I think this does it. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so I will move that cemetery trustee Jocelyn Murphy's presumptive conflict of interest in the expansion of the cemetery is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the municipality may expect from her in the role as a cemetery trustee. May I, <laughs> may, this is the problem of too many lawyers in the room. Sorry, Jocelyn. May I, <laughs> may I add one subclause to this, which is uh, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Um, presume kind of the uh, cemetery uh, uh, in the absence of an actual conflict of interest, which I obviously it was it was basically what you said, Jocelyn, correct? Which is, if you know the presumed conflict of interest, okay, where where the the select board understands that there's that presumed conflict, and they're 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 saying it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't impact your integrity of the services but if there were to be an actual conflict of interest which you would you've said you'd recuse yourself anyway that would just be that that would just be clear in the language is that right well i not exactly there are too many lawyers in the room mr Kerry. <laughs> because regardless of where the development is it, it's only a presumption there's no actual conflict of interest, right? It's a presumption. And that presumption is never gonna go away, whether the development is close, to, close to my property or distant from my property. So, um, you know, what I, what, I have, what I have represented to you is that if there was a development that was close to my property, that, you know, it, it, it appeared clear would, would have an effect on my property, I will come back to you. So I don't, I don't think, See, I don't think you can distinguish between a presumed and actual conflict. It's well, simply a presumption of a conflict. Right. I mean, it just seems, seems that as long as we, the, that language should be in there, right? Um, but all right. I, it's... We're just going to have to trust. <laughs> okay. I'm happy. Whatever the board wants to do is fine. This is, uh, this is why the Talmud is 30 volumes long or something like yes. that. Yes. No worries. <laughs> Okay, um, so not included in the language, but at least my understanding, I think the board's understanding is that, you know, if it starts to make us nervous, you will try to seek the board's direction. If Absolutely. If, if, that's very clearly abutting your property. Yes, if a bulldozer appears in my side yard, I will be back to see you. <laughs> so all those, in favor um, of what I rattled off. <laughs> Please say aye. Bernard. Aye. John. Aye. Miriam. Aye. Mike. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good night. So our last order of business are the home rule petitions mm -hmm. that town meeting recently passed at town meeting. Charlie, are you doing the presentation this evening? I don't think so. No. <laughs> okay. That surprised me too. Uh... <laughs> I mean, I can read off what they are. Yeah. Um, there yeah. Yeah, there was a um, the authorizing the town of Brookline to amend its community choice aggregation plan. That was warrant article 23. Then an act authorizing the town of Brookline to adopt green zoning bylaws and regulations. That was article 25. And finally, an act authorizing the establishment of a betterment loan program for the funding of electrification initiatives in the town. That was article 21. So this was debated heavily at town meeting and it was passed by town meeting and we have mm -hmm. a long tradition of 
putting it into the form that is required by our state legislature and delivering the will of town meeting via these home rules. Any discussion? Um, yeah, I, I would just say I appreciate the uh, tradition I'm going to vote for in this case uh, for these, uh, but I personally, uh, I have no um, commitment to being bound by that tradition in the future. Uh, I think it's important for us to exercise our own judgment over uh, resolutions that come out of town meeting for these kinds of things. Uh, I would okay. like to thank the council's office for putting these warrant articles into that proper form for them to be filed. And was it the clerk's office? Who has agreed to keep track of these home rule petitions? I, I think that I think it's both the clerk and town council have agreed to kind of. Oh try yes, and act. town council's office. Yes. Yes, John Moreski. Yes. Yes. Thank John you. Moreski. Yes. Thank you, John. Yeah, we've been asked to do that for a while, and you know. Everybody, everybody thinks it's a good idea and nobody's willing to actually do it. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so I can, I think I can move them all three together. Uh, I move approval of the filing of the following home rule petitions with the state legislature as a result of the 2023 special town meeting. Um, 2022, 2022. Oh, was it 22? Yes. Yeah, I was thinking of <laughs> the one last week. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the 2022 special town meeting. Um, and those are the uh, the ones that I read off earlier. Any further discussion? So all those in favor? Bernard? Aye. John? Aye. Miriam? Aye. Mike? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is the conclusion of our business this evening. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Move we'll adjournment. Second. Thank you, Second. Thank you Miriam. We are adjourned. <laughs> All right. Enjoy me.